Thank you, everybody. Um, I hope that this talk is interesting and informative. Um, so we're going to be talking about hoarding disorder today. Hoarding disorder is a tricky subject. There are TV shows about it. Uh, it can be pretty private for the individual. Um, a lot of people have a lot of thoughts about hoarding and what they know about it um, from people they've seen or what they've heard. Um, but it is a real disorder that affects a lot of people, and um, there are there are interventions, there are supports that can help. Um, and so I want to communicate some of that today. All right, so um, hopefully after this talk, you will have a better understanding of hoarding disorder, how it differs from clutter, how it differs from other things. Um, be able to identify signs of hoarding disorder in a loved one, um, because people with hoarding disorder don't always reach out. They don't always seek help. They don't always um, be a problem in themselves. And so sometimes it's on families to, to identify that and provide support and help. Um, we're going to talk about helpful interventions for hoarding and um, hopefully talk about uh, critically evaluating depictions of hoarding in the media. There are two main shows that, that uh, talk about hoarding, and so we'll talk about those. Um, so hoarding disorder is actually under the umbrella of obsessive compulsive and related disorders. I'm on the OCD team, so I have that lens. And because of that, I have learned about hoarding disorder and have treated a lot of people with hoarding disorder. Um, and individuals uh, with hoarding disorder often have this compulsivity that is kind of why it used to be under the umbrella of OCD, um, but is now a separate disorder kind of in the class of obsessive compulsive and related disorder. So in order to meet criteria, formal criteria for hoarding disorder, somebody has to have difficulty discarding items regardless of their value. Um, and this perceived need to save and a lot of distress with discarding items. There also needs to be an accumulation of clutter. So not only is it hard to get rid of items, but over time there develops a clutter that compromises active living areas. So that's an important point. Um, not everybody who has clutter has hoarding disorder. Um, it really needs to impact their ability to use their spaces, move around, be safe in their spaces um, as it gets more and more severe. Um, and then, of course, there needs to be clinically significant distress or impairment. And that can be a variety of things from um, it bugs me, I don't want to have to do this, to um, it's getting in the way of my ability to keep my home, um, it's getting in the way of my relationships, it's getting in the way of my safety. Then um, we can also have specifiers. So, um, some people who hoard also have trouble with acquiring excessively. That could be purchasing items, that could be acquiring free samples, free items. Um, so that's an additional specifier we might give if somebody also has that challenge. And then insight is another specifier. Some people who hoard identify that they have a problem, they want help, they see it as bugging them, they want to stop. Some people don't recognize that they have a problem. Other people around them might say, you know, this is a problem, I'm concerned for you, but they may not recognize it. So there can be varying levels of insight and we will make that distinction when we're giving this diagnosis. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about, about how hoarding differs from other problems, other problems that can seem on the surface quite similar. So this is a big table, I've separated it into two slides. I'm going to try to condense it as much as I can. Um, this is a really helpful table that I took from the International OCD Foundation website. Um, so if you want more information about hoarding, uh, you can go there. They have lots of, of good resources. Um, so in this table, um, it breaks down the difference between hoarding, normal clutter, collecting, and squalor. And it uh, breaks it down by what type of item is the person um, having difficulty discarding or acquiring, what is the method of acquiring, what is the appearance of the home and the life impact. So with hoarding, um, there generally is not a specific theme. Usually there are many different types of items that are collected. Um, that's very different than collecting, for example, where 
the items center around a specific theme. Um, so stamps, models, figurines of a specific type. Um, in terms of normal clutter, it would be similar to that. They may or may not have a specific theme. For method of acquiring, items aren't acquired in a planned fashion with hoarding. It's usually just kind of acquired over time or acquired impulsively, um, and it's often excessive. Um, items could also be free or purchased. Um, similar with normal clutter. Normal clutter, we're not really talking that it's, it's much different than hoarding other than just by like scale and degree. So the amount of acquiring may not be as excessive in normal clutter, um, but it's still kind of acquired, maybe impulsively, maybe over time, that sort of thing. Um, with collecting items are acquired through really planful means. They're usually purchased search for them. Absolutely. Um, with squalor, this may look similar to hoarding, but really the difference with squalor is that there's no intentional saving of items, there's no difficulty discarding items, but the house might have a lot of clutter, might be in disrepair for other reasons. Like so maybe the person doesn't have the ability to take care of their home for other reasons. Um, and they may uh, being, like neglecting their home. Um, in terms of appearance of the home, hoarding uh, can have disorganized clutter, taking over living spaces, like I said before, and it definitely can prevent living space from being used as it's intended. So some people might put items um, in the oven if there's no room for it anywhere else, using a chair for something, and now I can't use that chair. Um, filling a room with items, now I can't use that room anymore, those sorts of things. With normal clutter, it can also be disorganized, but it's generally more contained, located in storage spaces, basements, things like that. Um, and it doesn't prevent the space from being used as it did. Um, with collecting, it generally tends to be more organized. Things are in their place, things are being displayed, etc. Um, and then in terms of life impact, um, if somebody has a hoarding problem, their efforts to get rid of the items and not acquire can cause a lot of distress. So there's distress in the thought of discarding one of my items. There's distress with not um, collecting something that was free and that I might need someday, that sort of thing. This can cause conflict in social and family relationships, and the state of the home may um, be impacted and have an impact on surrounding homes as well. Same um, in terms of the state of the home, that can be the same for squalor. But again, it's a different reason. They don't have as much distress discarding items. Um, and then with collecting, it's usually mostly a positive life impact. Um, and with normal clutter, there usually isn't much of an impact um, on the negative side of things. Okay, so prevalence. Hoarding disorder is uh, the lifetime prevalence is 1.7%. It's actually pretty rare. Um, if we compare this to depression, depression is 8%. Anxiety disorder is 14%. Substance use disorder is 10%. Um, so, you know, it is rare comparatively. This uh, estimate though may be biased because a lot of people who work don't share that with others, it's kept secret, um, or they're not seeking services. Um, people who hoard tend to be, and this is just kind of like barely over 50% um, are older, unmarried, unemployed, um, but you can have a variety of demographic characteristics and still have a hoarding disorder. Um, okay, so let's talk about why we save things. I want to ask the audience, um, why do you save things? Can I have some, yeah, sentimental value? Absolutely, sentimental value. So um, this reminds me of, you know, this time that was really special to me, or this was my mother, um, and I want to remember her. Absolutely, yeah. Other things? I need it. I might need it. Absolutely. Yes, I might need it someday. 
Well, the answer is wrong. <laughs> I was just saying, with like craft supplies, it's like you might need it someday, or I got bought it because I'm gonna make this project and then you can never get to it. Right, absolutely. Yeah. You know what? Perceived value. I just like it. You like it, yeah. Like Perceived it. value, yeah. Yeah, if it's something like really nice that costs a lot of money, I might not want to. Even if I have no use for it in my house, right? Or if I like to look at it, um, but I know where to put it, I might still keep it because I like to look at it. Yeah. So people hoard for the same reasons we all save items for their aesthetics, for their sentimentality, might need it later, right? Um, I'm sure a lot of you have saved things from your children when they were in school. Maybe they're grown now and you don't need them anymore, but you're reminded of the good memories, right? Um, I saved boxes, um, nice boxes, because I might be able to use them someday. So we all save things um, for the same reason that people who hoard save. Um, so let's talk about some of the things that might make it an additional difficulty for those uh, who have hoarding disorder. Um, deficits in information processing. So that's just like how we think, how we plan. Um, so actually research has found that people who have hoarding disorder score higher on measures of ADHD. So more difficulty with um, inattention, kind of across the board and specific to items. So that can really impact, um, you know, your ability to focus and sort things for, a, for an extended period of time or be able to make decisions quickly. Um, people who are, have trouble categorizing. It can be hard to put things into categories and determine what to sort out, what to discard. If everything is unique and everything has its own value um, that can be really difficult so that can make it harder to then discard um, okay um, in terms of memory people who have hoarding disorder may have impairments in memory but what's actually seen really often is there's um, less confidence in your memory. And that can lead to, I'm going to save this so that I remember this thing that happened. It might help me remember that. Um, decision making can be hard for people who are across the board and with their items. Difficulty deciding, should I keep this, should I not keep this, um, and making those decisions. A lot of people who are also have perfectionism. So wanting things to be perfect, like the way my house used to be, and that can kind of get in the way of that making slow progress because it's not good enough. And so, you know, why even try? Um, it can lead people to focus on one area um, for a long time until it's perfect instead of, you know, good enough, which might, so that might get in the way of efficiency of these sorts of things as well. Um, okay, so attachment to items is also a big topic when we talk about hoarding. People who board report um, feeling emotionally attached to objects, and they can even feel like a sense of loss, a grief like reaction when discarding. I'm sure many of us have experienced um, like a tinge of distress when we're getting rid of something that maybe we might need or maybe was special to us, but we don't have room for it anymore. Um, that can be amplified in people who have hoarding disorder. Um, again, the memory-related concerns can let, lend people to be more attached to items, fear of not remembering the things that might be with that. Um, there could be a high responsibility of feeling like, I'm responsible for keeping this um, item safe, for keeping it from being trashed, um, from, you know, a lot of times when people uh, who are might see something on the side of the road, they want to um, rescue it, keep it from being trashed. I could use that, you know, and have a high sense of responsibility for those things. And then control can be a big aspect too. Um, there, 
can be the sense of this object is a continuation of me. And so when other people come into your life and try to tell you what to do with your stuff or try to get rid of it for you, um, that can be really hard. And, um, people who have hoarding disorder are often very sensitive to feelings of loss. Um, some additional features, um, acquisition can be a compensatory behavior to soothe a negative mood. So basically, retail therapy is a thing, right? And when we get new things, when we buy things, it can soothe um, negative feelings and can temporarily make us feel better. There's that dopamine rush, and that can definitely be a feature with working to her. Um, some clients recognize problems and express the desire to change, but it's still overwhelming to do that. They, they can't. While other people have lower insight, don't have distress personally related to the problem, just distress if they had to give away an item. Um, and some of these people don't even see a need for help. Um, I want to say that there's hope for both of these categories of uh, people who are bored. Um, and I'm going to talk about different things that the individual can do if you're wanting to get help yourself and what people around the individual can do to help support that person and uh, mitigate some of the safety hazards that might be uh, occurring, um, which is always the most important factor when we're talking about mental health. Okay, so we've already talked a little bit about consequences, but I'm gonna go into some. Um, so uh, family conflict and isolation can be big. Um, oftentimes there's a lot of arguments about um, what I should be doing with my stuff. Um, it can cause um, strife with family members. People disagree on what I'm supposed to be doing with it. Um, it can also lead to a lot of isolation. A lot of people who hoard, as the clutter develops, they may not want to have company over anymore. They may, um, the family may not want to come over anymore, and that can definitely increase isolation and loneliness. There might be safety issues in the home and the surrounding area, um, including fire hazards. So I don't have a way to exit my house in the event of a fire. Um, and um, tripping and falling hazards. Um, and also uh, it can impact the surrounding area. Sometimes the collecting or the hoarding gets um, to the yard or to outside of the house and can impact pests in the area, that sort of thing. Um, of course, everything, I do, I do want to mention that everything is on a spectrum, right? So someone can have hoarding disorder and not have any safety issues. Someone can have hoarding disorder and have all of the safety issues. So it can really vary in severity. Oftentimes there's a lot of shame and guilt about the state of the house, the amount of things that they have, because they realize that other people may be judging them for, um, for these things on the outside looking at. So that can lead people to isolate more, be private about it, not share a lot. Um, and I do want to note that avoidance of decluttering can promote more distress as the clutter builds, Things more overwhelming. The more you avoid, the harder it is to do some of these things. And of course, there's a financial strain. Um, if there are storage units that need to be paid for, um, the financial strain of buying things excessively um, that can definitely impact. So I have a case example that I wrote uh, based on a variety of, of patients that I've had in the past. This I would say would be a, a moderate severity level of um, hoarding. And um, I guess I'll just let you read it.
Well. I'm curious if you guys have any comments um, or thoughts about this piece of people. You said it's a modern case. Moderate to severe. Yes. It seems pretty severe to you. So it does seem to be judgmental, but yeah. it does seem severe because she can't use the space anymore. And yeah. It doesn't want people to come over. I was just thinking it seemed a little more severe than months. Right. Yeah. And I would say, you know, just like hoarding disorder is a spectrum. Hoarding can exist without actually meeting criteria for a hoarding disorder, right? So there has to be a certain level of impairment in order to meet criteria for that clinical diagnosis. So you're already, you know, in the area of this is bothering me, this is impacting my life. Like I told you before, we had a quarter in our, our basement apartment, and this lady saved everything she possibly could, HLs in the stove. Uh, empty glasses in the cabinet, uh, dog hair when she brushed the dog, loaded with a, in an inside of a uh, laundry basket. Um, I tried to go Victor, and so I had someone from the county come and take a look at the apartment. And he said, ma'am, this is nothing. You have no problem here. This is, this is not an excessive case at all. I was going out of my mind because it was, I thought it was a fire hazard in my own home. But when the inspector came and said, it's just, it's not that much of a big deal, I was shocked. Yeah, that's that's great. That's helpful um, context. Yeah. That even, even to somebody who's not used to seeing these sorts of environments, it might seem like a lot, but it's in the relative to, to what it could be, it could be mild for it, yeah. Um, so I really wanted to provide this to help you get a glimpse into the mind of somebody who hoards, um, how difficult it can be in the family and how it can cause um, some, some strife. And also the various factors that can lead it to continue. Um, and different decisions made along the way that might um, inadvertently make the hoarding problem a bit worse and worse. And then you made a comment about a clinical diagnosis. So somebody that has a hoarding behavior, do you have to have a clinical diagnosis to get professional help? I would say, no, you do not need a clinical diagnosis to get professional help. Oftentimes, insurance requires a clinical diagnosis of some kind when someone is seeking mental health care. Um, but no, absolutely not. Um, if you're wanting help and you're you're seeing this as a problem in yourself and you're wanting to make some changes, absolutely it would be appropriate. Okay, so um, because a lot of people who are, um, aren't seeking help themselves, some do and that's great and that um, definitely leads to better outcomes. If um, you have a loved one who you think may have a hoarding disorder, I'd like to talk about how you might help them. So some warning signs from a great book um, that I would recommend anyone. Um, it's called Digging Out, Helping Your Loved One Manage Clutter, Hoarding, and Compulsive Cluttering. Um, so in this book, they have warning signs, including the home has no access areas, meaning you can't access that area or you're not allowed to go in that room. Um, you and your loved one talk a lot about their stuff. So if a lot of the conversations you have with your loved one are about their stuff in any way, um, if your loved one has difficulty throwing things away, acquires too much, uh, some of those main criteria. Um, home and personal space is filled with clutter. If they have trouble sorting, organizing, making decisions about their possessions, that could be a clue. Um, and if they can't function safely and comfortably in the home. It could be other things as well. So um, it's important to consider that, you know, in people who have dementia, um, there can be a collecting of items 
Um, and it, it's more product to the dementia than any specific difficulty with discarding or distress with discarding. Um, and relatedly, it could be squalor because the person doesn't have the ability to take care of themselves, to take care of their home. And that could be why we're seeing a lot of clutter. Um, and it could also just be clutter. So, um, you know, clutter, clutter through the, you know, with your eyes, um, visual clutter, visual clutter. Um, if somebody has a lot of things, they may not necessarily uh, have a problem. Um, it may just be that they have a lot of clutter in their house. So I'd like to talk about some treatments for hoarding disorders and supports. Um, so cognitive behavioral therapy is um, an empirically supported treatment for hoarding disorder. Um, this really is on an individual basis, teaching the person skills, about how to go through their items, how to discard, how to resist continued acquiring, and really practicing these things in real time. I will um, go over this in more detail. Um, medications, so the same medications that you might use for anxiety and depression can be helpful for people with hoarding. Um, harm reduction is a helpful solution if somebody is not wanting help, not seeking help. It can be a way to mitigate some of the safety concerns. Um, so, for example, um, reducing the fire risk. But the, the goal is not necessarily to eliminate the hoarding. It's just to help the person be live more safely in their home and kind of meet them where they are and what they're willing to do. Um, I also think family therapy is really important in this process. Hoarding can impact not only the individual, but their families. Sometimes there is um, many years of argument and hurt um, and if you are going to work on this with your family, or if you're going to work on this, number one, it's really helpful to have a lot of support around you and people helping you through this. And if you don't have a good relationship, if you don't have communication skills, if you don't feel connected, it's going to be harder to do that. Okay, so kind of behavioral therapy. This is what I do um, a lot of the time. Um, so this is kind of a big model, but this is how we look at hoarding um, and then what we use to determine how to address it. So at the top, there's these vulnerability factors. So um, if there are personal and family vulnerability factors, there might be genetic vulnerability factors. You might have seen family members or that might feel normal to you to save things, uh, certain values, sentimental values, et cetera. Um, there might be vulnerability to anxiety, depression, um, things that might make you uh, feel like you need to soothe those negative emotions. And the information processing problems like we talked about before, so problems with attention, problems with decision making. Um, these can impact the meaning that we put on possessions. And then that, of course, impacts um, everything that follows. So we have two emotional reactions and then two kind of cycles that can occur from those. So um, feeling a negative feeling, like sad, angry, um, distressed with discarding. If you escape that or avoid that, that's just kind of gonna reinforce that feeling. So, I'm faced with the prospect of discarding something. Mm, I'll do it tomorrow. Oh, that negative feeling is gone. I'm gonna continue avoiding that and that's gonna to lead to clutter building up. Um, on the positive side of things, acquiring new things feels good. So I'm gonna be motivated to keep doing that. So that's kind of all of the factors that we consider when we're doing cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy for hoarding disorder has several different um, components. So the first component is motivational interviewing. Um, a lot of clients come in from the encouragement of family, and um, it's really important for them to find their sense of motivation. Why is this important for me? 
why is it worth it for me to go through this uncomfortable process of discarding these things? What is it I, I want? What is it I'm looking forward to when I'm able to do these sorts of things? So really going through that process and creating a safe space for people to talk about how they're not sure if they want to do it or not and, and have somebody on the on the other side listening and allowing them to get there kind of on their own without so much pressure. Um, we definitely work on problem solving and decision making. So addressing those um, cognitive uh, problems um, and difficulties. So problem solving, like teaching somebody, how do we solve a problem? We identify possible solutions, we pick one, we do that. Um, and decision making, you know, really steps for how do we make a decision and then practicing that. That's really the biggest part is um, there's often, it can be made worse by, I'm not gonna make any decisions, so I'm not gonna make them. Right? And then you get out of practice with making decisions, especially decisions about your stuff. So we'll definitely do a lot of practicing and deciding what we're discarding, what we're keeping, um, and problem solving. Closure and response prevention. This is um, an intervention that we use for OCD. The same thing here. So exposure therapy is helpful for anxiety disorders. It's helpful also for um, helping people get used to the distress associated with discarding. So let's practice discarding things. It'll get easier the more you do it. Just like it's easier every time, every time I'm in a room with a spider, it gets easier every time <laughs> that's fine. Um, and then the response prevention would be the part of, um, so with OCD, when we're talking about response prevention, we're talking about not doing compulsions. With hoarding, with response prevention, we're talking about resisting acquiring. Can I be in a store where there's a sale and not buy that item and really practicing that? And again, that gets easier and easier the more you practice. And then cognitive restructuring, this is really addressing the thoughts that might be maintaining the hoarding. So I might have a thought that if I get rid of this, I'm never going to remember that ever again, or um, I'm going to be distressed forever. Um, and so really working on the thoughts that an individual has and helping them challenge those um, can be helpful. CBT for hoarding can take six months to a year. Um, so it's a little bit longer than some other um, CBT for some other uh, diagnoses. I will say home visits are preferred. So if the therapist can go to the person's house, be in their house, um, help them with discarding in their home with their actual things in the rooms where they exist. Um, it can be really helpful. It helps increase accountability. So um, as a therapist, I might give somebody homework. Um, and if they're coming into my office, it might be easier for them to kind of like fudge the homework. But if I went into their house, it might be harder and they might feel um, more accountable to do it. If home visits are not uh, possible, which is often the case with busy therapists who can't take the time to visit the house um, and with insurance uh, limitations. Uh, we can take pictures of the house and, and, and plan in advance. So looking at the living room, okay, what are you going to, to practice discarding in here? Um, people can actually bring a box of items to the therapy office. Like, I don't know which one of these to keep, which one to not keep, and we can practice that in office. Um, CBT has um, been empirically supported. There is a significant effect on hoarding symptoms. I do want to point out, though, that in, in our research studies, um, the majority of people at the end of treatment are still in the clinical range. So the hoarding is not gone. It's just significantly reduced. Um, and they found that more sessions in the home lead to better outcomes. Um, with harm reduction, our goal is really to reduce harm, not, not necessarily eliminate hoarding. So, for example, we might help somebody clear a pathway to the door so that they can safely exit in the event of a fire. Um, we might work with people who are um, facing eviction, facing, um, you know, child protective services are involved, adult protective services are involved. 
Um, how do we reduce the harm that has come from their white problem and, and help them in a way that is amenable to that? Why do you guys think that this might be a helpful alternative? Helps the relationship with the family. Okay, yeah. Why do you think that? Because if you're actually able to function in the home, there would actually be there versus avoiding the home. Oh, yeah, definitely. I agree. Any other thoughts? Keep them safe. Keep them safe, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, if somebody doesn't want help, it's really hard to make them, right? So, this is a way to keep them safe a way to, um, you know, perhaps get our foot in the door um, with having the conversations around hoarding in a way that's not um, going to cause a lot of conflict with the family in a way that's still supporting them um, and where they are. Um, so there are some different things that might be um, evaluated depending on the level of hoarding. So there might be safety or legal issues, like I mentioned before, adult protective services if the person is not um, deemed not capable of caring for themselves or if there are children in the home, CPS might be involved. There might be health and safety and fire code violations. Um, there might be eviction notices. And um, what the digging out book um, that I mentioned before recommends is that um, the the therapist and the care team um, include these people as team members. So trying to um, include them in the shared goal of helping this person stay in their home, help them be safe in their home. Um, and so we're not kind of conflicting with them. They're, they're part of the process. It can be helpful to conduct a home assessment. Um, it was really um, advised that there are as few people as possible. And depending on the safety, you'll want to, to take into consideration if it's safe to enter the home, do you need to have different um, protection on? Um, but if you're conducting a home assessment, really helpful to have as few people as possible. If there's a lot of people in there, that can be really traumatic to somebody who um, has a hoarding problem. Um, it is really important to show respect to this person um, who has been hoarding. These items are important to them. They're already perhaps feeling some shame. So it's not going to help if you're like, ew, gross. You know, I don't, that's, why do you do that, right? Showing respect can be really helpful in, in um, just supporting them and helping the person be more willing to work with you through this process. Um, taking photos is also really, really helpful. Um, a lot of people with hoarding disorder um, under-report the amount of clutter in the home, so it can be helpful to really just have that um, to show them, to work through, to work on, um, to show others if necessary. Let's talk about why people may refuse help. Um, I want to ask you guys again, um, why do you guys think people might refuse help? Doctor, if I could, nice folks, if you speak, I know you can probably hear when the air kicks on. They're saying from the Zoom, they can't necessarily always hear you. So if you could just speak up when you reply, thank you. First thing that I thought was embarrassment. Embarrassment? Yeah. Coming in and having somebody living at home, take pictures. Right. Like an embarrassment of dishes. Right. Right. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Any other thoughts? They don't think they have a problem. They may not think that they have a problem. Absolutely. Yep. That can be a reason. Fear that somebody's going to take their stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Fear. Like if I tell people they're just going to come in and they're going to take all my stuff and I'm not going to have any control over this process. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Along with the embarrassment, just the shame. Absolutely. Yep. So um, people might refuse help because they have poor insight, meaning they don't see it as a problem. Absolutely. 
they might disagree with family members or others about the best solution to their problem. So some people might um, want to just do it on their own, right? I can do this myself. I don't need other people. Um, there might be fear, absolutely. Fear of facing this, fear of starting an overwhelming process, fear of getting rid of things that um, are really special to me, um, fear of other people coming in and, and taking my stuff, absolutely. Hopelessness can also be a reason that people don't seek help. So they might feel like this problem has gotten so bad, I don't know a way out and there is no way out. And so there's no use even trying. And then of course, resentment and mistrust um, I may not trust a therapist to come in here and know they're not just going to take all of my stuff away. Um, there might be resentment with family or other people who have in the past, you know, taken their stuff without their consent or, um, you know, had really heated arguments about it. That can create a lot of resentment. And personal values, um, you know, if somebody values privacy, if somebody values um, saving, Things so that they can use later, they may not want to change that. They may not want to see that. Okay, so um, this slide is really about kind of stamp that can be helpful if you're a family member of somebody who reports. Um, so it's important to present a non threatening, understanding stance. Um, so, number one, forgive. Oftentimes, there's, there, there are past hurts. Um, I have a family member say to me, it can be hard feeling second to somebody's stuff. Um, so that can feel hurtful and there might be some resentment there. Um, or if, you know, they, they're not listening to me, why don't they listen to me? Um, this is an ongoing conversation. Um, so while that, all of that is valid, um, it's not helpful when you're trying to help somebody um, do something that's really, really hard for them. Um, so forgiveness um, is an important thing to consider when you're trying to help a loved one. Um, empathize. Imagine if somebody came into your home and looked at all of your things and were like, hey, you don't need this. I'll just take it. Right? Like that is overwhelming. That is invasive. That is stressful. Um, and so empathizing with the embarrassment and the distress that may come with that can be really helpful. Um, set boundaries. So this can be helpful, um, like for example, if you don't feel safe in someone's home, it's okay for you to say, I'm not gonna visit anymore because I don't feel safe, or I'm not going to let my kid come and lay on the bed if there is, uh, Stuff on the bed, at least please take it off of the bed um, so that I feel better about um, my son coming in and visiting. So setting boundaries in a respectful, in a way that empathizes um, can be really helpful. Um, give them a sense of control. Um, involve them in the process as much as possible. Um, have them um, feel like they can make choices about what we do with their stuff, where we start, who we're going to, where we're going, when we're going. Um, that can be really helpful in, in keeping them engaged. This is the house. This is really simple. Um, hoarding can flourish when people aren't coming over, right? If, if I'm expecting company, I might want to declutter, you might want to clean a little bit. So simply visiting your loved one can be a helpful um, thing to do. Let's talk quickly about what is not helpful. Um, a surprise clear out of their house is not helpful, um, despite what the hoarding shows will tell you. <laughs> um, taking everything out, that can be really, really traumatic on a person. I'm sure you guys can empathize with that and imagine how that could be true. Um, it's not helpful to explain or try to convince people why they don't need certain objects. Um, just like OCD doesn't really respond to logic, hoarding a lot of times doesn't respond to logic. It's more about an emotional connection and the distress is real. 
Um, and so it can be unhelpful to try to convince somebody um, why they don't need something. Discarding items or clearing out storage units without their awareness or consent is not helpful. Um, of course, with all of these things, it's, if it's possible not to, don't. If there is an imminent safety concern, then we might have to make some different decisions. But um, in general, my advice would be, don't get rid of their things without asking them, without involving them in the process. Um, it doesn't end well. Um, secrecy also not helpful. So if family members are talking to each other about someone who hoards, that can lead to mistrust and resentment as well. Um, endless financial support is also not helpful. So similar to setting boundaries, um, it can be unhelpful to continue, you know, funding someone's, um, like it can be, you know, problematic to fund somebody's addiction. Funding someone's excessive acquiring habit might not be the most helpful thing. And making discarding decisions for the person is often not helpful. So like, oh, you don't need this, right? That doesn't help them learn the skill of making the decision, which will be more helpful long term. I do want to mention realistic expectations. Um, so um, we don't have a lot of long-term data on how um, effective um, these interventions are um, at keeping hoarding down or for it to continue after the intervention has ended. Um, it's a really hard problem. It's really sticky, meaning it doesn't like to move um, and it can be really challenging. Um, but I have seen a lot of people show some progress. So um, yeah, just realistic expectations for and, and um, as a family member, I think it would be helpful to change your expectations about um, their house may never be completely clear, um, but we can reduce the clutter and that might be helpful. Okay, hoarding in the media. This is kind of my last section and then we can get to questions. Um, so there are two main hoarding shows. Um, I think the hoarder show is on A and E, and then Hori Buried Alive. Um, I want to talk about how accurate these are in terms of depictions of hoarding, um, and what I think they do right, um, and how I think they might be helpful and harmful. So, the duration of the intervention usually with these hoarding shows is like a couple of days. They come in, they clear it out. Um, it makes really good television. Um, but it's often not the best long-term solution for someone. They don't learn how to not continue doing this. So my hypothesis is that once these people leave, once the teams and the camera crews leave, the hoarding will continue and they will fill up the house again. Um, severity of the hoarding problem, I would say that these are pretty severe but accurate descriptions of hoarding. I do think that they zoom in on the squalor aspects of hoarding, meaning, you know, the pests or the mold or whatever might be happening um, for entertainment value, um, but that might not ac accurately depict, you know, the whole hoarding problem. Um, in terms of depicting patients, um, especially in, I forget which of the shows, they, usually the patient has like, something that happens to them that um, is like a turning point for them. That's not always what's happening. That's not always when people seek help. I do think they do a good job of depicting how hard it is for the person, how distressing it is for the person, um, and some of the difficulties with making decisions and categorizing objects. I think they also do a good job of depicting how hard it can be on family members to watch um, someone with a hoarding problem, especially a severe one, um, suffer and not know what to do to help. Um, the teams involved, usually in these shows, there's a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a professional organizer, a hauling company, a dumpster. And these teams can be also involved in real life 
supporting situations. Um, usually not all at once where they like descend on the person, um, but uh, oftentimes a multidisciplinary approach is best. Like me as a therapist, I don't have great expertise in organizing per se, but an organizing company might be helpful. Um, usually uh, with more severe hoarding cases, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be called out and it is overwhelming for the individual to do it on their own. So it can be helpful for um, people to involve these companies. They also don't talk about how much this costs. So it can be quite costly to involve, um, you know, a hauling company, rent a dumpster, et cetera. So I'm gonna sum my presentation up. Um, these are kind of the main points I'm hoping that we uh, get you today with. Um, so first hoarding is a rare, but a serious condition that can have a lot of impacts on the individual um, and the community. Um, people hoard for a reason and for some of the same reasons that we all save items. So um, I hope that that helps uh, empathize a little bit with individuals who hoard. Um, there are treatments that can help if the person is willing and Sometimes a harm reduction approach is the best option and can also be really helpful. Um, boarding on TV is real, um, but there are some limitations to, um, to the accuracy of it, um, and it might be a little bit different. Um, the process of decluttering might take a while longer than is depicted on the show, and it's okay because these are longer term um, skills that we want the person to be able to develop. Um, and so the boarding problem didn't develop overnight, so it's not going to go away overnight. I have a lot of resources here. Um, we do uh, provide outpatient therapy services and residential therapy services um, at the Linear Center of Hope. We um, work with a number of people with boarding disorder um, there. It can be helpful though to work with other people in the community as well to assist with um, all of these new things that you might be trying to do or you might be trying to help your family member do. So I have some local professional organizers on here, um, cleanup companies, lots of books. Some of these are for people with hoarding disorders, some of these are for people who love somebody with hoarding disorder and um, some websites for support and more information um, dumpsters so i would love to open up to questions if people have any um if you're online